or do these plays have to pay up for being good or bad? Well, let's find out with Pay the Writer. Antonio Dell's Pay the Writer, Rustin Fisher is a literary agent, and Cyrus Holt is a financially successful and acclaimed Black writer whose professional and social lives are entwined for 45 years. As an older man, Cyrus has one more novel that he hopes will be translated into French by Jean-Luc and published. Over the years, Cyrus has married multiple times and has had numerous girlfriends. He maintains a close but contentious relationship with his first wife, Lana, the mother of his now adult and estranged children, Leo and Gigi. Can Cyrus make peace with his family before it's too late? I really did not like this play at all. I felt like the dialogue seemed overly heavy on expository information. I never felt like these were characters having believable dramatic conversations. Pretty much everything felt artificial, patently contrived, predictable, and boring. Something especially annoying was how Cyrus and everyone else kept repeating how great a writer he was. It felt so self-congratulatory. Despite their connections with various partners over the years, gay men for Brutzen and straight women for Cyrus, the deepest emotional attachment for both men is for each other. While the relationship is not sexual, it's sometimes scripted as a rom-com. They meet cute and somewhat antagonistic initial encounter of the two men feels like a setup for it. The cafe scene in Paris seemed like a honeymoon scene. That to me seemed more interesting than anything else in this play. The actors are all quite good, but I just hated it. So it got mixed faces minus only because the actors were good. Surprise, surprise, Mark hated it, and I, of course, loved it, and disregard and disagree with him completely. Normally, I don't like to be narrated to, but Brian Batt as Brewston Fisher was so charming and erudite that I felt like I was sitting next to an entertaining dinner guest. Normally, the plot concentrates on the writer, but no, ever, no one ever thinks about the literary agent who makes it possible for the writer to be seen and published and get a fair shake. Another aspect that is never explored is a translator. In this case, we get Jean-Luc, who has a snarky relationship with Brewston, and Jean-Luc feels somewhat triumphant that he got to read Cyrus's latest book before Brewston did. Lana, his fiery ex, is played to the hilt by Marcia Cross, who I adored in Desperate Housewives. So it was thrilling to see her on stage. Sparks flew between Cyrus and her. I mean, Ron Canada was great as Cyrus as a focal point for these two people. And he was perfect for that. I, I, be I believed all of it. And unlike Mark, I especially like the younger version of Bruston and Cyrus and the fateful day they met. It established a special bond and friendship, which is even more profound than a rom-com situation. That is why Sex in the City continues to be popular, because it focuses more on friendships and various love interests, because friends last for longer. There was an entire TV series called Friends. So the expiration of this friendship means everything. And it, it just, to me, the glue, it makes it so funny and moving to me. And I found the conversation very realistic, realistic and quite moving at times. I laughed and cried and really cared about them. My only quibble is we kept hearing about his young wife but never meet her, so she seems rather superfluous to the story. I thought this was a wonderful play and I give it a happy face. Mm. Presented by Spit and Vigor, Anonymous is written and directed by Nick Thomas. It's performed in a small black box Gowanus theater for an audience of only 16. The audience is seated among the participants in an addiction group therapy session in 1992. As stage manager greeter, Ethan Lindout informs us that we are embedded 
but the performance is not immersive. We're not supposed to speak to the performers or pretend we are members of the group. What a relief. For this evening, the group's leader of two years, Charlie, has asked group member Richard to replace him and lead the group. Richard is a very sympathetic man who is suffering from his girlfriends ending their relationship. Rachel enters next wearing a power suit and saying fuck is every other word. She presents herself as a tough stockbroker. Sarah has maintained her sobriety despite working as a bartender. She was a popular actress model in the past, but hasn't gotten gigs regularly. Elizabeth enters in an expensive, long, perhaps raw silk dress with a beautiful cut velvet scarf. She talks about her East Hampton home and her social group of beautiful people. Blake, a handsome young EMS worker who is stressed out by his inability to save everything. Diana, a primly dressed young woman who has never spoken in the group, but will open up with a harrowing story this session. Charlie makes an unexpected and very disturbing entrance. It's a rare privilege to be in such an intimate connection with the wonderful performer. Their stories are compelling and masterfully told. The script is very natural and the characters are recognizable. Coffee, tea, and cookies are an added treat. I gave this a happy face. And they have monthly shows, so you can still see it on September 15th and October 20th, and you can see it in their tiny black box theater in Brooklyn. Information on the Facebook page. Broadway Through the Seasons was a wonderful musical review covering the Broadway seasons from the early 1940s and the early 1950s. It was an evening full of marvelous singing with the likes of Tony Danza on stage, uh, ren rendering songs such as It Never Entered My Mind and Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered. And I didn't even know that some of these songs were uh, part of Broadway musicals before they became part of the classic Americ American songbook. The show was moderated by Scott Siegel, who had energy and life and fun as he told us little factoids that might have put somebody else to sleep. But in the hands of Scott Siegel, he kept us interested and laughing. It was a marvelous evening. Broadway Through the Seasons, I'm looking forward to seeing the next part when it comes out, and I definitely give it a happy face. And we should mention it was for the seasons of 1940 through 41 and 1951 through 52 were the songs that he chose for this particular season, with, of course, his usual perennial Ross Patterson band. So we don't just get great singing that will make you chortle or weep, but magnificent tap numbers from Kendrick Jones and Danny Gardner with the Broadway by the Season dance troupe. Other standouts were Ali Ewald singing My Ship Unplugged and He's Only Wonderful and a very funny bit with Jason Gra and a music stand and sweeping while sweeping us off our feet with that tongue twister Tchaikovsky. And you can currently see Mr. Gra in Mufti's How to Steal an Election as Calvin Coolidge. I'm gonna talk about that later. I was thrilled they did three songs from one of my favorite musicals, Paint Your Wagon, Wandering Star, and they called the wind Mariah, which Douglas Ladner sang Unplugged, and it captured the restless poignancy of those songs. And Tony Danza has impeccable phrasing, and he added, and he added to the spectacular tap dancing. Julia Murney sang a song that I've only heard Karen Akers do, if you hadn't, but you did, which is one of the greatest you done me wrong songs ever. And while Christine Crow Knoll broke our hearts telling her husband, guess who I saw today, which is this beautiful buildup about a woman who goes into the city and stops by for a bite to eat. And there at the bar is a man and a woman who are smitten with each other that she finds touching at first until she realizes it's her husband. 
Bill Dougherty has this rich voice and sang this song I never heard before called Love is a Simple Thing, which was a most descriptive love song. This was a thrilling evening and I can't wait until September 11th for the next one. It's going to be the same place at Kaufman Merkin Hall. So really, Scott Siegel also, if you don't want to wait till September 11th, check out 54 Below because Scott Siegel puts on so many shows there and they're all brilliant. So happy face from me too. Mufties is back, yay! And they're doing How to Steal an Election, a Dirty Politics Musical. How perfect is that? It's got music and lyrics by Oscar Brand and a book by William F. Brown, and it's the perfect vehicle to bring Mufti back from COVID exile. How to Steal an Election may deal with the corrupt and turbulent times of 1968, but it most certainly applies to this century as well. Jerry protests the Vietnam War as he doesn't want to be drafted. April is a hippie who is pro-choice. Calvin Coolidge, who Jason Gra is portraying, materializes to straighten out these young people and help them with their causes and complaints by referring to past presidential candidates. Some of the candidates that won and some who didn't, but put on a good show, just like this one. It's all in the packaging. And you get to find out about Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. <laughs> Using the political system to present yourself as a champion of the people and their needs is how you are able to fool the people into voting for you. Meanwhile, Coolidge is sneakily trying to win these young people over with his smooth talking and this brilliant ensemble singing and tap dancing help. With lively tunes, helpful projections of the historical characters mentioned, and some incredible singing and tap dancing from the ensemble, this was an entertaining escape from the stressful politics of today. Jason Gra is this mischievous leprechaun who strikes gold with his performance. Emma Degerstelled as April and Alex Joseph Grayson as Jerry and April represent the gung-ho youth who feel that they can still make a difference. I thoroughly enjoy this and thank you, James Morgan, for once again bringing a musical forgotten classic to our attention with one heck of a cast, music director, pianist, and those wonderful rolling music stands. Major happy face. It's, this one's closed September 3rd already, but you still have a chance to see the other offerings from Mufti's. The Lieutenant is from September 9th to 17th. Golden Rainbow is from September 23rd to October 1st. And I told you about that panel I had at Broadway Con with James Morgan, Mel Miller, and Robert J. Snyder. Robert Snyder. Well, he James Morgan talked about how to steal an election. So you get to see some of my panel now from the Broadway Con. Welcome to presenting classic musicals of the past with three brilliant people who have been doing this for a long time and you're our newcomer. Yes. So first, James Morgan. Jim Morgan is the producing artistic director of the York Theatre Company known as the place where musicals come to life and they sure do. And they've done that for over 50 years winning awards, making over 40 cast albums, and having shows move to commercial productions on and off Broadway. His career as a scenic designer includes over 300 shows at theaters around the country, including 125 at the York, but who's counting? <laughs> we do musicals, but we specialize in the Mufti series, which brings back musicals from the past. Uh, which deserve to be seen again. And we've done 118 in that series. And um, we're, we've just announced a four show series in September. Uh, so that'll bring it up to, I don't know, 172, I think. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, the Mufti uh, name came about from Janet Walker and her husband. Janet was the founder of the OR. Uh, Charlie was in the Navy, and he came up with Mufti, because that's what they said in the uh, Navy for people who were not in uniform. And he said, why don't we call it Musicals in Mufti? Um, it was founded the same year as Encores, 1994. And 
somehow we have struck a chord with audiences through the years. Musicals and Mufti is back! Just Yay! Yeah. And how about we're doing four of them, right? Four of them. Well, one is a, a, another series called New to New York, a show called uh, When We Get There. Uh, but it's, it's presented the same way, very minimal, a week of rehearsal and 11 performances. How to Steal an Election by Oscar Brand and William F. Brown. The Lieutenant by Chuck, Chuck Strand, Gene Curti, and Nitra McAuliffe. Golden Rainbow, Golden Rainbow by Walter Marks and Ernest Canoy. And When We Get There by Charlie Barnett, Robert Young, and Richard Lasser. These aren't the sort of great American shows that you could see encores do, and we all adore encores, of course, but I think that's what makes the York so special, because if you really want to find these sort of hidden treasures, this is the place to go to. Um, and Joseph directing How to Steal an Election, the first show, and he's talked about, talked about uh, putting it back together. He found the score at Lincoln Center and the, the score at Library of Congress and the book at Lincoln Center. Lincoln Center. And had to put the, it, it, it was off Broadway in 1975, it was a big hit, and the authors, uh, it was going to move to Broadway, and the authors found that the money for the Broadway move was being put up by the mob. <laughs> so they said, we don't want anything to do with the mob. So the show was never published, never licensed. There is a great recording on RCA Victor because Oscar Brand had that, those kind of connections. But other than that, it's not been heard in 50 years, and Joe's put it back together, and it will be on our stage in September. Please come. <laughs> One of the uh, signatures of the Lucky series was actually created by Stuart Ross, who's directing uh, Golden Rainbow. Rolling music stands, which allows uh, actors' hands to be free to gesticulate, and for it to move around the stage with them in an interesting pattern. That's one of the signatures of the, of the Mufti series, the rolling music stands. And we found three of them in the storage, and we have to recreate five more before we begin the series. The Shark is Broken by Ian Shaw and Joseph Mixon is now on Broadway at the Golden Theater, directed by Guy Masterson, and it's about the filming of Jaws with the three main actors, Richard Dreyfuss, uh, um, Roy Scheider. Roy Scheider. I almost have Lee, Lee Schreiber. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired. And of course, Robert Shaw. And it's his son, who is a dead image of his dead dad, wrote it and stars in it as his dad. Anyway, go into it. Go into your dance. <laughs> uh, the play is actually a comedy written by Ian Shaw, son of the late Robert Shaw, about a specific aspect of the filming of the Jaws movie, which was the tension on the set, very well known today, between Robert Shaw, his father, Roy Scheider, who plays the sheriff, and Richard Dreyfus, who plays Cooper, the science guy. Oh, we should say that it's about this... It's based on this movie, Jaws, I, if you haven't seen it, it was in the 70s, so you maybe not know about it, but basically it's about a shark. Who doesn't know about Jaws? Well, young people do. Oh. Young people don't know anything. They know anyway, about Jaws. Anyway, anyway yeah. it's about sharks attacking people on the beach, which right now is very pretty yet because that's what's happening right now all over the place. But And then uh, you have the, the sheriff played by Roy Scheider. You know, and then you have the scientists, like you say. That, anyway, they're all trying to go after Bruce the shark because they want to, you know, like Moby Dick, make the world safe for beachgoers everywhere. During the filming of the actual movie, the mechanical shark, which was nicknamed Bruce, broke down a lot. And so these three actors, who two of whom had massive egos, were stuck on set waiting for the shark to be repaired. This play focuses on the scene in the cabin of Quint's boat, the Orca, where they are waiting for Bruce to once again work. 
and their egos clash, they fight, they bicker, they quarrel, they play cards, they lie, they boast, they get into physical displays of strength. And above all, the, the character of Roy Scheider, who I don't remember who he's played by, but he is oh. the peacemaker, yes. Uh, it's Colin Do Donnell. Okay. Uh, he is the perfect Roy Scheider. He's tall and he's skinny and he wears his glasses and he's got the black turtleneck years before Steve Jobs. And <laughs> he plays the peacemaker. The guy who plays Richard Dreyfus, Alex Brightman. He was Dreyfus. He was short and doughy and pudgy <laughs> and nervous. And he was constantly needing to be validated affirmed and praised. And he was, of course, desperate to be famous, desperate to be famous. And he was also sort of cowed by being in the presence of Robert Shaw, played by oh, Ian Shaw. E oh, right. Of course, duh. <laughs> played by Ian Shaw, who really is a dead ringer for his father, except maybe he's twice as tall. But it's it's really the audience starts laughing before the play even begins for reasons I won't go into. But. It's a good mix of about three quarters of laughter and about a quarter just sort of watching as things unfold. And one thing that I didn't realize was that the famous Indianapolis speech that Robert Shaw gives in the movie was written by Robert Shaw. He was given the original script, didn't like it, got drunk, rewrote it and delivered the speech that we all know because everybody knows Jaws. That yeah, but everybody I don't, I don't remember knows. the Indianapolis story. Well, it's, I haven't seen this movie since 1975, for God's sakes. Indian, the Indianapolis speech was written by Robert Shaw. His son delivers it perfectly, except he doesn't say the word bomb the way his father does because Robert Shaw pronounced it boom, and he said <laughs> bomb. That's how often I've seen the Indianapolis speech. Uh, and yes, Ian Shaw sings farewell to ye fair Spanish ladies, made famous by his father in the movie. Um, I loved it. I thought it was absolutely hilarious. It's short, it's 90 minutes, but if you want just like a really good play to go and enjoy and laugh at, because in this day and age, who can't use a laugh? I mean, really, given everything else that's going on, go see Jaws. I give it a happy face plus. Yes, and you better see it quickly because it's going to be swimming away soon because they're not getting the audience they were expecting. Are you serious? I am so serious, which makes me so sad because really it's it, so... It won awards in London. How is that possible? Go see Jaws for God's sake. Because it's Americans. Two people are on the beach. They'd rather be at the beach than, you know, and, and be attacked by sharks and actually go to the theater where it's safe to see being attacked by a shark. Oh, and you can buy shark pens in the in the basement. You can buy for five dollars. You can buy a pen that looks like Bruce the shark and says Jaws. Uh, it says the shark is broken on the side, which is the shark is broken. Of course, references the fact that they would always be yelling at the actors. The shark is broken when Bruce broke down yet again. Yes, and I loved all their little quirks, like like Roy Scheider. He's always reading the paper and going and 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 going into all these trivial nonsense that nobody really cared about. But he was really, you know, like a little nerdy guy. And then, of course, Ian Shaw drinking heavily and putting bottles of alcohol all over, hiding them so well he couldn't even find them. And of course, Richard Dreyfus is just, you know focusing on his career like oh i just made the apprentice of duty crubbers i thought that would make me famous and and i, I want to be maybe this will make me famous it's like he wants everything so obviously it's all before goodbye girl because i wondered if he was still as insane after goodbye girl as he was pre goodbye girl but it was just so much fun i just loved it and i'm giving this a major happy face plus two and that boat setting was really good. Yeah, they actually had the, the, and the cabin as a cutaway. And they made you yes. feel like, you you know, I got kind of seasick and they had birds flying overhead and clouds rolling by. I mean, you really felt like you were on a boat yourself. And they actually used some of the props from the movie. I'm giving a happy face plus two. Me too. You not you maybe you could get pens downstairs, but I got this for a present one. It's a cookie jar. <laughs> and it, well, 
it's broken now, but it used to be able to go. The shark is broken. It is because it used to go da 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 when you ever you opened up to get a cookie. I have to put a battery in this thing, but I love this thing. <laughs> So that's better than the pen, I'll admit. <laughs> so and enjoy. <laughs> Helena Wine Rouches, A Will to Live, directed by Rick Hamilton and adapted by Kirk Gostowski. This was an astounding performance from Marsha King. She held that stage for over two hours, relating the most harrowing story of such unrelenting cruelty suffered from sadistic creatures, I will not deign to call them men, during the Holocaust. Helena never lost her humanity, and by helping out a fellow prisoner at one point with kindness and compassion, this came back later to save her life. We all know about Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen, but I never heard of the slave labor camp in Poland, Plajau. And the commander, Amen Get, is one of the most evil mentioned ever. He took great delight in murdering people. He makes Putin look like a pussycat. The fact that this woman, Helena Weinrauch, survived is a testament to the will to live. Everybody should see this. Much as they try, they will never erase us Jews, and she is the proof. And Mark had so much more to say on Facebook. We both felt like this was the most incredible thing, and it will live in us for a very long time. It is a must, must see. Two major happy faces. 910, this play, timed in conjunction with the 22nd anniversary of New York City's Darkest Hour, is a new play by Richard Willett that tells four stories set in World Trade Center on the night before September 11th. It's a production of New Directions Theater, directed by Eliza Beckwith, and the review for Lisa and Me is going to be on the Facebook page. Meanwhile, City Gate Productions has a couple of shows going on in Queens, Got a Carnage and All Shook Up, and going on in Manhattan is Alt Hamlet, To Feed the Roses, there's monthly shows, Two Foreskins Walking, A Hotsy Totsy Burlesque, a Neurodivergent New Play Series, uh, Picone Arts in association with Sour Grace Production has the flight patterns of migratory birds, and one night only Asimov Award recital is September 10th. Odd Salone Hallow is September. September Hallow is September 19th. And it's a new season coming up. You know, so go see our favorite shows. Check your listings. Check Facebook. I'll have a listing of all our favorite shows coming up. Next show, September 23rd. Mm-hmm.